the book has kind of a split personality going on. Almost. Like half the story takes place over one day, which is the, his wedding and the war of, um, where the Prince of, Prince of Arrow, I think it's the Prince, is, or is it the King of Arrow? Uh, it doesn't sound like I think it's the Prince of Arrow. He uh, tries to take over um, because he tries to become the Emperor of the, this Hundred Year War, which I didn't talk about in the first book, is a reference to the actual Hundred Year War, I am so certain of it. And also, like, the entire world is the reference to the Holy Roman Empire. Because it's going to be one emperor with lots of kings that can squabble between them underneath him. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. I just wanted to just quickly mention that. So, that half the story is like this one giant battle. And the other half is the four years between this book and the first book. And it gives the book kind of a... A weird feeling, and then like the third part is we have uh, Catherine, um, his aunt, like step aunt or something, like the girl she he's in love with, um, like her notes that she's written through, like she writes throughout these four years, at least some of them, like from her diary, uh, to give her perspective, and the book kind of gets really really split personality to me, like. Because the main story is definitely this, like, they call it the wedding day, because that's where the war and everything goes on. And everything's leading up to this. But it doesn't feel like it's the main story, and it doesn't feel like it's satisfyingly leading up to it. It really feels like... Eh. Well, oh, well. <laughs> got distracted by a bird outside. Um, it really feels like the story... One that he, like Lord Mark Lawrence wants to tell is the four years taking up to it, but he felt like he has to. Um, and that's, eh. and yeah, it, like we're totally. You can totally read the four years and then read the we wedding day storyline right afterwards, and you will see how everything got up to that point, and that w it would make perfect sense. But it it just doesn't feel qu quite right. But I mean, oh well, <laughs> I guess. Um, so the story feels a little bit uh, split personality, and it does hamper it a little bit. I think the grids can. Like comparison I can make, and for uh, Daniel Green, it's a, I feel like it's probably a huge recognition. But for me, it's actually for neither of them good, and that's Daniel Green's second book. I don't know, but it's named over here somewhere on the shelf. Um, uh, in his Breach of Peace, Rebels Creed, it's called, uh, where he did the same thing, where everything takes place in the past, and then there's a main storyline in the modern times. And the problem is with that is you remove a lot of urgency and if you don't do it well it's really 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 boring to read and not that this book was boring because it was really good but at times it was actually boring because you removed a lot of urgency you know all the characters are gonna be there at the end like if the characters weren't mentioned in the um, wedding day story and you knew they were gonna die in the four year one so even like when Gork or Gorkov, well, Gork died, didn't die in the four years start. Yeah. Spoiler, but he didn't quite die, but he did die. Um, and Gorkov left, of course. Like, you knew because they weren't there in the throne room doing all the, like, with the brothers. So it's like, wh why care? It, it really makes it difficult. I think the best book I can recommend for reading that is by Jay Kristoff, and that's like, what 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 was it called again? It's gonna be on the screen. <laughs> um, but okay. So and then another thing, and I think it's it, because the book is like supposed to be post-apocalyptic. We're going back to the middle medieval ages. Of course, age of consent and marriage and stuff is immensely different than um, than modern times. So he marries a. I think she's twelve. I think Miana is twelve years old. And that's really awkward, but the best part is he is like, this is weird, she's a child, why, why am I doing this? But he has to for the alliance basically. So it's it's great, I, I love that there's a slight amount of self-awareness that what they're doing is weird. Um, I do like my, Miana as a character, I think she's awesome, I think she's basically Jork in female version. Like she has the same darkness in her, the same cold calculator mindset and all and it's just, oh it's so good, give me more. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I wish she played a bigger role. I really want her to play a bigger role in the third book. I think that would be awesome. Some other things I did like though. I really, really, really enjoyed um, what's called like the expansion of the world. We get to see so many new places. We get to meet so many new people. We even get to learn about magic. We learn where the magic comes from. We learn the system, why it's there, what happened to it. And that this isn't actually magic, but still is. And we learn, literally learn that a lot, like the builders are not out and of our future, but they are the past past for, um, for Jorik and Makin and the Prince of Arrow and all those guys. So it's like, really weird to read because they clearly understood quantum mechanics and they made these machines that can run indefinitely without um, without like maintenance basically. I mean it's hugely unrealistic but it's awesome to see. And we get like explained that they then started because they kind of reached almost a limit it sounded like. So they started to work with going okay how about we do the uh, little tinker tinker can we control and by element stuff. Can we can we control laws of nature? And that failed for them. And that's why we see like Ferrakin, and we see the, the dream watchers and stuff like that, and they're just losing sight of reality and the physical realm. And it's great. It's really great expansion, and it explains why there's magic. Also explains like necromancy and stuff like, and it does eat people up. So, yeah. Uh, what else did I want to talk about? I had like a list, but I forgot to bring it with me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so what I also what I want to talk about is like Jorik as a character, because in the first one he is he's a tool, like okay, he's not a tool. How do it? He's he's an insufferable prick. Now he's just a prick. Character growth, guys. We got character growth. <laughs> no, so this character growth we do see from Jorik is insane, because he goes to visit his uh, mother's side of the family, and. Like in the first book, he would have been a prick to them, he would be mean, evil, be ready to kill. And he even highlights a lot of it himself, like, oh, no, the old me, first book, would have killed here. But I'm like, no, I don't want to do that, I don't see the need, I don't feel the need for it. And I know it's a bit on the nose, but it's a great introspective character development that we get from George. It does make him less of a prick and in some ways it does actually take away from the story at times almost. Because that is part of what made him such a unique character was that the main character was the good guy. But, well the bad guy. Um, that he's turning more and more the good guy but like he ends the story literally by saying he will make the world burn if that makes him emperor. And I believe him, he will. And I want to read the third book and figure out if he does that. So yeah. That's kind of all because I don't really want to spoil too much. Um, so, in conclusion, should you be reading this book? I, I would say so, yeah. I think it's a good book, I think it's a fun book, and I think it is worth it a lot. So, uh, yeah. And oh, read the first one first, of course. The only thing is, it does split, uh, suffer from split personality, and it is like if you read them back to back, the two first books, you will feel like the first book is so much better. Um, he, I, it's just so much better. Of course you could argue that uh, all urgency is gone because he's writing to us in the story. But it just makes it, so it's kind of like did he actually remove urgency by split personality? And I would say yes, just because I, I, I feel like the amount of time we spend on the, I'm, I'm going in service. Okay, I'm gonna finish this split personality because it is a huge deal. So, and I really don't like it. So. I think when you go for split personality like this, your main story should still take up the most space. Taking the J. Christoph book I highlighted earlier, it's split between telling how the main character get got to where he was, and then where he is current, like where he is telling the bad guy the story. And telling the story is like, like where they are in the cell is like ten percent, like five to ten percent of the book. The rest is the story. Here. The main story, it's, to me it feels like it's clearly the wedding day story. Because that's how he became like king of multiple countries. But that's not where we are most of the time. We are not 
spending most of our time talking about the wedding day. We're talking most of our time the four years. So really what Mark Lawrence should probably done is split this book into two short books. Or made, it, made this book even longer, gone into way more detail with the war, of course. It's also difficult because it is just one war that, that takes over one day, basically. So it's also like pacing is a thing, but I think he could have done that. So yeah. Would I recommend this book? Only if you like the first one. Um, it is a good book, but it's definitely not as good as the first book, um, sadly. Yeah, that, 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 those are my thoughts on it. I'm going to stop now, or I'm going to start rambling around in circles. So uh, yeah, leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more random rambles from me.